Hello, and welcome to this eSchool News webcast. My name is Andrew Barber, and I'm a senior contributing editor here at eSchool News. And I'll be acting as the moderator for today's presentation, which is sponsored by Aruba. And today we're going to get an update on the federal e-rate program and discuss how schools can navigate the program to secure funding for their Wi-Fi initiative. Uh, and in particular, we're going to take a look at some of the eligibility guidelines, uh, some of the key deadlines you're going to have to meet, and strategies for applying for things. Uh, but before I hand things over to our speakers for today, let me just take a couple of minutes to highlight a couple of items about the console that you're looking at. Uh, first, we are going to be recording the event, uh, so you don't have to take notes or anything like that. Uh, in a couple of days, we'll send out an email to everyone on the call that will contain a link to the recorded event, and you'll also be able to download a PDF of the presentation from that same email. And second, please ask questions. Don't feel as if you have to wait until the end. At, at any point during the presentation, if you have a question, simply type it into the Q&A box on your console and uh, hit the Submit button. And I think we'll have some time during the presentation and certainly at the end for our speakers to address your questions. We also have a chat function, which you can launch uh, if you look at that blue group chat icon down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you know, use chat to talk among yourselves about, uh, about what you've done with E-Rate uh, or to contact me or the eSchool News team uh, with technical issues or concerns that you may experience with the console. But uh, I do have one favor to ask of you. Please don't use the chat function to ask our panelists questions. Uh, they simply won't have time uh, to monitor the chats while they're presenting. So once again, if you have a question for them, please use the Q&A panel instead. And with that out of the way, let me introduce you to today's speakers. Uh, John Harrington is CEO of Funds for Learning, an educational consulting company that specializes in the E-rate funding program. And John has been helping schools and libraries receive E-rate discounts for more than 20 years. Uh, his team and he have prepared 14,000 applications, totaling more than $1.7 billion for students. And our second speaker today is Dan Rivera, a product marketing manager for Aruba. And for more than 25 years, Dan has held a career in the information technology industry with a focus on the primary education sector. Now, before I turn things over to John, I'm going to ask the members of the audience to answer a quick poll question that will help John get a sense of where you all stand with respect to the E-Rate program. Uh, and it's a very simple question, how much of a factor is E-rate in helping to achieve your district priorities? Uh, and you've got just three questions there, three answers uh, available to you, very somewhat or not important at all. And I'll give you just a, a second to, uh, to choose, and, uh, and we'll go on from there. Uh, let's take a look and see what happened. Uh, Okay, there we have it. We have that 75%, an overwhelming majority, say that uh, it is a very important factor in helping to achieve district priorities. And so on that note, I'm going to uh, bring in John. Welcome, John. It's a real pleasure to have you here. Are the poll results indicative of what you're seeing from schools across the country? Absolutely. Uh, I would say it's uh, right in line with what we see. In fact, we've conducted several national surveys and uh, the response rate is right there around 75% of uh, uh, applicants saying that, you know, the E-rate is very important, uh, plays a very important role in, in, in their uh, pursuit of their district's priority. So that's fascinating uh, to see that. I appreciate you doing that poll. Uh, you know, and that this really sets the stage then for why this discussion is so timely and relevant. Uh, E-rate funding really is the dependable source for internet access and uh, Wi-Fi support nationwide. It's uh, really the go-to source. So when you've got a program that lines up with school districts' needs uh, so significantly, and it's really the source to go to, it's important to understand uh, you know, what this program entails uh, and what, what the latest rules, uh, what the latest policies are, and that's really what we're going to focus on uh, for the next few minutes. Uh, I wanted to start with uh, just a, a quick uh, testimonial. This is from one of the school districts that 
uh, we work with, Funds for Learning works with, uh, we'd sort of ask them, hey, you know, just, just put into your own words, you know, why is E-rate so important? Why is it very important to your district's priorities? And uh, just a few excerpts from their testimonial, they, they said our students are on devices such as iPads or Chromebooks every day, and those require consistent internet access to complete the individual lessons and check-ins, and that the E-rate funding has allowed them to develop and maintain a technology infrastructure uh, that is really uh, required today uh, in this particular school district's uh, experience. It's helped them stretch their technology budget further. They estimate that they've increased their bandwidth to their schools uh, by a factor of 10, and it's also helped them get into a sustainable uh, replacement cycle for their uh, technology. So not looking at technology as one and done, but instead a, uh, a lifestyle, an ongoing commitment. So you've got uh, in this now uh, framework the, the E-rate program itself, which is helping to support this mission critical technology. You know, obviously uh, the process of education uh, is uh, has many facets to it. Technology is an important framework now for helping to support, empower, and equip the teachers, the students, and so on. To do it well, though, requires these inter enterprise grade networks. You know, in that testimonial, the this, this school district talked about the fact that they have to have consistent internet access and they have to have uh, a sufficient internet access. So big enough pipes that are there that are dependable. And this really uh, requires then that school districts have very robust, solid, well-engineered, uh, up and running uh, networks. Uh, the E-rate program uh, really fits the bill uh, uh, to provide that, support that mission ideally. It's the largest single source of educational technology funding in the United States for K through 12 schools. It supports both public and private schools and charter schools. Uh, nearly all of them participate. Uh, public library systems also qualify. And the program provides discounts of 20 up to 90% uh, on eligible goods and services. So it's, uh, it's a significant opportunity uh, to the tune of almost $4 billion a year for these mission critical services. Now, it's one thing to talk about $4 billion a year, and that's a big number, and that's exciting, kind of, but what does that really mean for the typical applicant, uh, for the typical school district? And uh, we pulled the numbers from 2015 just to kind of give you a sense of what it looks like on a per-student basis. Now, these are nationwide averages. Uh, you know, it varies from school to school, school district to school district, and so on. But just to kind of give you a general sense even of what we're talking about when we talk about uh, the E-rate opportunity, in 2015, which is the last year that we kind of have closed the books on, the average school district received a little over $32, $32.07 per student for their Internet access, their data services, and uh, voice telephone services, referred to as Category 1 or C1. Uh, the average school district received uh, $21.19 per student for Category 2 services. That's uh, wireless access points and related equipment. Uh, so on average, um, a little over $50 uh, a student, about 50, uh, $53 there per student nationwide in 2015. Uh, you can also look at that on a per-site basis. Uh, the Average on a per site basis for the, the telecommunications and internet access, $8,321 uh, for on campus connections, the uh, wireless access points, and so on, on average about $54,000, and that's based on a 70% 70, 70 discount. So, uh, again, averages, uh, statistics can, you know, all sorts of bad things can happen with statistics, uh, but I do think it's important to just sort of understand. Not just that the E-rate program is a four billion dollar a year program, but in you know in general terms, what it might look like for your school district. And those are probably numbers that you can use to, at least to give you kind of a, a general sense of uh, how how you might uh, benefit from the program and and maybe how you're stacking up today. I want to spend uh, 
the remainder of my time uh, talking through these four items. I want to kind of give you an update of where things stand today, uh, where you should be uh, uh, focusing your energies as it relates to the E-rate application process. I do want to give you a policy update, kind of talk about what's going on in Washington, D.C. right now, uh, give you a, a quick overview of the 2018 eligible services list, which was just recently approved and didn't have any uh, particularly um, significant changes to it. And then I also want to talk about Category 2 funding uh, and why it is so important that you consider applying for that now. So where do things stand? Well, the E-rate program, if you are uh, new to it, uh, is an ongoing annual process that ends up taking anywhere from uh, uh, 24 to 30 months to sort of uh, complete a particular cycle. And all those cycles kind of uh, overlap with one another. So we are today in the process of finishing up payment paperwork for the 2016 funding year. Uh, there is a uh, deadline next Monday uh, for the 2016 recurring services uh, invoices. So if you've got reimbursement paperwork for internet access or, or telecommunication services that you've purchased, now is the time uh, to get that uh, paperwork done. Uh, you may also be up against a installation deadline for one-time work. Uh, if, uh, if, if you don't know where your 2016, uh, the status of your 2016 paperwork is, uh, you really should check that to make sure that you're not missing that deadline. You can request an invoice extension uh, if you have not submitted yet your 2016 invoice uh, or payment paperwork, but you need to get that extension in by the deadline to get those invoices in. So just make sure that you, if you don't know today where your 2016 uh, funding commitments stand, uh, you need to double check that because you are pushing right up against uh, a deadline for the 2016 uh, funding year. Uh, we are today inside of the 2017 funding year. That runs from July 1st, 2017 through June 30th, 2018 for recurring services and through September 30th of 2018 for non-recurring services. Uh, about 40% uh, or a half of the applications have been processed for 2017. So those applications were submitted last spring, and USAC, the E-rate program administrator, uh, is still processing those. Again, about half of them have been processed. Uh, if you are uh, still waiting for a funding commitment decision letter, uh, it's not unusual to be in that position right now. I would, however, encourage you to reach out to USAC. Make sure that there isn't some question that's uh, come to you that you aren't aware of. They, they may think you're waiting on them, uh, or they may think that uh, they're waiting on you and you're waiting on them and everyone's just sort of sitting there and nothing's happening. So, uh, again, I wouldn't worry too much if you haven't gotten your application funded yet. That's not that unusual, but you should take steps today to check on the status of those funding requests and find out if there's specific information that USAC needs and get them that information as fast as possible. We know that there is a direct correlation between the date of a funding commitment and your ability to actually leverage that opportunity. The sooner you get the funding commitment, the more likely you'll be able to take advantage of it and do uh, uh, all those wonderful things to drive, uh, uh, to drive, to influence, to impact education in your school district. Last but not least, uh, we are planning for the 2018 funding year. So uh, 2018 uh, will begin July 1st of 2018, and that will extend to uh, for uh, non-recurring services all the way to September 30th of 2019. That is the time frame that you should be considering this fall, July 1st, 2018, through September 30th of 2019. Now, I will tell you, that's, that sort of makes my head uh, spin a, a bit to basically be looking out two years into the future, but that, that is what you're being asked to do as you consider your E-rate application and procure goods and services this fall. It is for those services that extend all the way into the fall of 2019, and that is uh, really what you should be asking yourself, asking others within your school district, what do we need, uh, what types of goods and services should we be pursuing uh, so that we have our 
students that we have our teachers positioned for success uh, in, in the years to come. A quick uh, overview of uh, the 2018 funding year. Uh, many school districts are asking about the opportunity to purchase fiber optic wide area networks or WANs as a part of the reform of the E-rate program that passed uh, several years ago. Uh, the FCC decided or saw fit that applicants, schools and library systems could purchase their own fiber optic wide area networks in some situations. Uh, you may hear the term self-provisioned fiber optics or self-provisioned network. Uh, that's what that refers to. Uh, so that is a, a, a big time discussion for your school district. That's not just something you sort of run out and do. Uh, it's a very strategic level type of discussion. And that if you are sort of in that camp, you want to be having that discussion right now, uh, considering it, because it takes uh, those applications are, are uh, quite complicated and involved and takes several months to get together. So, uh, but if, if you are interested in purchasing a fiber optic WAN, now is the time to, to consider that. Uh, also, don't forget that the support for telephone service is being phased out in 2018. Uh, your phone service uh, will qualify for an E-rate discount that is your discount minus 80%. Uh, so, for example, if you qualify as a school district for a 90% E-rate discount, uh, you would receive a 10% discount on your telephone service. So all but the most, uh, uh, the highest E-rate discount school districts will receive support for the telephone service in this next year. The vast majority of applicants will no longer receive support for telephone service. Uh, you should be aware of that. You should also make sure that your accounting and finance officials are aware of that. Sometimes they craft those budgets uh, thinking that the E-rate discounts uh, will sort of be there and they need to know that the telephone uh, support that they've looked to for many years uh, has all but disappeared now uh, from the E-rate program. And I would say, unfortunately, but that is the case. Uh, also, the uh, EPC system, the E-rate portal that USAC launched a number of years ago uh, is still in place and it's still a bit of a challenge for applicants to utilize. Uh, the uh, big takeaway is that you should not, uh, you, sh you should give yourself a safety margin in terms of time. Uh, it might take you a little longer to do your paperwork in their system than uh, than, than you'd like to. So make sure that you uh, are uh, building in extra time to use that uh, EPC system. Uh, last but not least, there's been no official date yet set for the 2018 funding window. Uh, so remember, each year there is a funding window, a filing window in which the applications are all submitted. We anticipate that it will open in, in January and that it will close in March. But again, the official dates have not been set yet, but you can plan on that general time frame. Uh, so you know, what should you do today? If you haven't yet, uh, start your procurement with an eye towards uh, submitting your application uh, sometime, really I would say in January or February and that gives you a little extra uh, breathing room in case, uh, again, you have difficulty using the EPC system or you are trying to get the, uh, the contract signed and so on before that application is submitted in March. Uh, it, it should not close earlier than March, uh, but that it, they are aiming to close it in March. It could slip into April. I wouldn't plan on that. I would plan on a March uh, deadline for the Form 471 application. Recall that the E-rate program places a strong emphasis on the competitive bidding process. And that uh, falls under the umbrella of the Form 470. Uh, the Form 470 is the E-rate program's uh, RFP system. Uh, it works in conjunction with your state and local competitive bidding rules. Uh, when you post a Form 470, uh, you also uh, release your local RFP at the same time. Uh, and uh, the, the only, the, the biggest change in addition to just preparing that form is that you have to wait 28 days from the posting of your Form 470 before you sign a contract. Now I've got a graph here on this slide just to kind of give you a sense of where things stand and uh, you don't necessarily have to read all these tea leaves here, but as someone that looks at these things a lot, uh, what this slide tells me 
uh, is the number of Form 470s that have been posted, and we are actually at the highest level we've been since 2015. So in 2016 and 2017, uh, the, the pace at which the Form 470s were posted was a little less, a little lower. Um, as of about a week ago, uh, there have been eight, there's, there has been 835 Form 470s posted nationwide, and that's growing. That's uh, picking up speed. We expect that there'll be over 30,000 of them posted uh, by the time uh, the uh, the competitive bidding season is done. But I'm actually encouraged to see this uptick in uh, the number of Form 470s that are posted. Remember, the E-rate program, uh, as I said, places a special emphasis on competitive bidding. The FCC, who sets the regulations for the E-rate program, wants to see that you are getting the best prices for, for the best solutions that meet your school district's needs. Uh, when you submit your application, uh, you need to be ready to answer the question, why did you pick this vendor? Uh, what, was, what was the uh, criteria uh, that you utilized? Uh, how did you evaluate the bids? And remember, cost must be given the highest weighting of any of the factors that you consider. Uh, you can give uh, some consideration to other factors, such as their experience, the quality of their solution, whatever those other factors may be, but cost must be given the highest weighting of any factor as you evaluate your bids. And then once you have selected those vendors, uh, then you can sign a contract and submit your Form 471 application. And remember, you must sign that contract before the Form 471 application is submitted. So if we step back and sort of put all this together, E-rate is mission critical to the really the priorities of your school district, most likely. It's the largest source of funding for education technology. Uh, we've got a deadline of March for uh, funding applications to go in, but the best practice would be to aim for February. That means you'll need to have contracts awarded sometime, let's say, early February, which means uh, you really need to start your competitive bidding process now if you haven't done so and get your Form 470 released and your RFP released so that you can wait your 28 days, evaluate the contracts, and then make your recommendations to the board so that they can uh, award those contracts sometime uh, either in maybe even uh, late December or if not, sometime in January so that then you have a week or two or three to get your Form 471 application prepared and submitted. Uh, Okay, so E-rate policy update, uh, you know, the uh, uh, change in administrations in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, always brings with it questions about the status of various programs, and E-rate, of course, is such an important program to so many school districts, so I thought it would be uh, wise to just give you an update on where things stand. Uh, you know, the, the first bullet point on this slide really tells you almost everything you need to know. Uh, E-rate dollars flow to essentially every zip code in the United States, red state, blue state, uh, north, south, east, west. Uh, every school district, by and large, anticipates uh, receiving E-rate discounts every year. And they align well, uh, the E-rate program does, with many of the goals uh, in D.C., uh, uh, many of the uh, Express goals of the Trump administration having to do with uh, connecting, uh, you know, rural America, bringing jobs back to America, those sorts of things. Uh, the uh, the need for high-speed internet access, broadband connectivity, all aligns uh, very nicely with the stated goals of the current uh, Trump administration. Uh, at a lower level, uh, we look at the FCC, where the E-rate program rules and regulations come from, and uh, the leadership there at the FCC, again, on both sides of the aisles, uh, have expressed support for the E-rate program. Uh, the current chair of the FCC, uh, Chairman Pai, uh, has consistently talked about his support for the E-rate program. And then um, on the Democrat side, uh, we have uh, Jessica Rosenworcel, one of the commissioners there, who is a longtime proponent 
a very strong voice for the E-rate program. So the the current leadership of the FCC uh, seems to be very much on board with the E-rate program and understanding the significant role that it plays in education. Now that's not to say that there won't be changes coming in the future. Uh, the FCC is currently considering making changes to the program. Uh, many of the reform measures that were adopted uh, back in 2014 will uh, kind of sunset after the 2019 funding year. So the FCC will really have to take up, take up the issue of E-rate soon. We expect that next year uh, there will be a, another a notice of proposed rulemaking. Uh, that the FCC will come out and talk about what the E-rate program will look like um, after 2019. Uh, this should not be a surprise to you, and you shouldn't be too concerned when you hear that happen. Now, uh, that doesn't mean they, they couldn't screw it up. That doesn't mean, you know, changes could come that wouldn't be bad. But uh, it's sort of uh, when, when the last round of E-rate reform was passed in 2014, it was baked into the process that there would be uh, new changes, uh, new reform later, and we expect that that will begin, that that process will begin sometime next year. Uh, the reform process itself takes very, it takes a, a, a long time. It's sort of geological in time frame. Uh, I, I said here on the slide that it took about two years last year for the E-rate reform to go through or last, last go around and I expect it will be very similar, again, uh, that, which is why the FCC uh, is beginning the process now of looking at reforming the program. And one specific aspect of the program, the use of Category 2 funding, uh, which we will talk about here momentarily, uh, they are currently asking for feedback about that, and that's because uh, it's uh, baked into the regulations that they had to ask applicants uh, ask the community for feedback about the Category 2 budget system. And uh, this week, uh, just this past Monday, on October 23rd, there were uh, Category uh, 2 comments filed. Uh, and uh, there are, uh, there's now a reply period that runs through November 7th. So I encourage you, to the extent that you look at any of those comments and agree or disagree with them, you can submit comments to the FCC uh, through November 7th, and you can do that online at the FCC website. You don't have to go through and hire an attorney or a consultant to do those comments, but I encourage you to uh, uh, to speak up, especially to the extent that Category 2 funding is important for your school district. In 2018, uh, the eligible services list is going to look very similar to what we've seen in the past. Uh, there are no major changes uh, to the eligible services list. Uh, the FCC, when they released the new eligible services list, primarily just provided clarifications. And some of them were very technical in nature. One had to do with inside wiring. Uh, there was some questions about the wording associated with data cabling inside a facility that has two schools. So if you had, uh, let's say, a two-story building and one building was the middle school, and the, or one floor, and the second floor was maybe a charter school. There were two entities, and they had wiring going between. Uh, uh, was that considered Category 1 or Category 2? And some things that uh, us E-rate consultants can get really excited about. You know, can you, kind of like the same way an accountant might get really excited about, oh, can you count this as a deduction or not, uh, that the inside wiring uh, – and the designation between Category 1 and Category 2 was something that had been some debate about. The FCC basically took the common sense approach and clarified that, hey, if, if all the wiring is taking place inside a structure, then that's all going to be Category 2 uh, uh, network cabling. Uh, they also clarified that uh, network security and caching are not eligible for Category 1 discounts. Uh, that firewalls and caching are uh, continue to be eligible under Category 2 for purchases. And they also uh, underscored uh, that uh, they, they don't like duplicative services. Uh, anything that they, for example, if they see a school site having Internet access from two different vendors, they consider that duplicative. And, uh, and they've really dug their heel, heels in on that. I'm really not quite sure why. I don't think that America has an excess bandwidth problem. 
I think that America actually has just the opposite. I think we need to get more bandwidth out to schools and libraries. But that is uh, that is my opinion and my editorial comment. Uh, the rule of the law says today that anything that looks like duplicative services will not be funded. And you know, I, I mentioned here, I say here, advocacy highlight Aruba ESL comments. Uh, each year, applicants, service providers can submit comments on the eligible services list. And that is how uh, there is change made to that eligible services list. M most of the time it takes several years. These things, they, you know, they kind of get the discussion flowing. They don't necessarily make the changes right away, but those changes do come about. And uh, it, is, it highlights to me the importance of advocacy. And I'm going to do a little shout out for Aruba. They are sponsoring today's <laughs> uh, presentation. Uh, but, you know, uh, they're sort of putting their money where their mouth is when they are out there. They submitted comments for the ESL uh, discussing uh, what they thought were, I believe, uh, pretty common sense items about network management and some other things. Maybe Dan can mention that if he has a moment. Uh, Aruba also submitted comments uh, just this past week uh, related to Category 2 funding. And uh, to me, that's just a part of being a good corporate citizen. And we all have a responsibility, I believe, to provide information to the FCC, to provide feedback to the FCC, uh, the FCC has a $4 billion pot of money that they are using to try to uh, impact education in America. And they're doing the best that they can, but really they don't know what they don't know. So it's very important that we all step up and participate in these opportunities. And submitting comments as a part of the uh, eligible services list is a great example of how you can do that. Okay, so let's, let's talk about Category 2 funding requests. And uh, before we go into that, I have another poll question for you. Uh, I would really like to know where you stand in the use of Category 2 discounts. Remember, Category 2 discounts are capped. Each site has a particular budget. So would you say that, uh, in general, you know, mission accomplished, you've used all of your Category 2 budgets for your school district uh, with a vast majority? Uh, or are you more of a work in progress? Yeah, we've used some of our C2 budgets. Yeah, I mean, you know, maybe half of our sites we've we've used the C2 budgets. The other half we haven't. Or maybe you're just getting started. You've, you know, you've, yeah, we applied for a little. We've got some, but but you know, we haven't done much. Or maybe you haven't even touched it. Maybe you don't even plan to do it. You know, where do you stand as a school district in general on this continuum? Mission accomplished, a work in progress, getting started, or nothing at all. Let's see. Well, let's. See. You guys, you know, I'm I'm really impressed. You uh, you're very much a, a cross section of what we are seeing nationwide. Uh, you know, Funds for Learning works with schools and libraries nationwide. We get we get to see a lot of different environments, and uh, in our communication, I would say that this is very consistent. Uh, we've got about uh, just shy of 10 percent of the uh, participants today have maxed out their C2 budget. Okay, yeah, we've used it, and uh, that is almost exactly what the nationwide percentage is. Uh, for about 38, 40 percent of you, you've used a good portion. Probably, you know, half of your sites you've got funded, and now the others you haven't at all. Uh, and about a third have not even touched it yet, and uh, and you've not you've not gone out there. So let's let's talk about these category two discounts and why they are, I believe, so important. Uh, all applicants now qualify for Category 2 discounts. In the prior uh, st structure of the E-rate program, uh, it was set up in such a way that just a small percentage of schools and libraries would qualify for discounts uh, every year. That has been changed, and now every school district, every library site, every facility uh, that is used for educational purposes qualifies for a Category 2 discount. So these are wireless access points, switches, cabling, all the related ex expenditures associated with that. Uh, now the the discounts are capped, uh, but uh, you know that um, doesn't mean um, you know it's it's not going to be everything you want, but it's also going to be a significant amount of money t towards your overall goals. Uh, the caps themselves are calculated either on a per student basis 
for a per square footage basis for libraries, and there's also a per building minimum for um, small school sites. So it's uh, it's indexed to inflation for the 2017 funding year. The uh, per student cap uh, was $153.47 per student. So you can multiply the number of students at a facility times that amount and then times the discount rate of your uh, school district and that will give you the amount of funding that you qualify for for Category 2 funds. Uh, now just you know, to, to go a little deeper here, uh, sometimes uh, schools uh, don't fully comprehend the opportunity that exists before them. Uh, so not only are we talking about network routers and switches and wireless access points, we're talking about the cabling that goes to those, the data cabling to, that connects those different devices. Uh, we're also talking about the UPS devices that support them. And the other nuts and bolts, things like racks, conduit, uh, literally the nuts and bolts that are necessary for that equipment to be installed, as well as the actual installation, configuration, shipping, if you, if you are taxed, uh, pretty much any fees associated with getting equipment up and running on a network. And so it's, it's uh, sometimes we work with schools, we see them, we come in and they've purchased the equipment, but now they're counting on their technology staff to get all that equipment installed. It takes the months to do it because they already have a backlog of work to do. When you submit a Category 2 application, make sure that you are capturing not just the, the top line router switches, wireless access points, but also the, the installation, the configuration cost that will uh, reduce the overall cost of that project and also most likely speed up the process. Now, remember, I've, uh, there are two, uh, I've got two really important points that I want to emphasize related to Category 2 and our survey result that, that we just conducted. A third of you haven't used your Category 2 budgets at all. Uh, another third of you have used some of it. Well, remember I said that change will be coming to, at, at, to the E-rate program at some point. Right now, the FCC is asking for feedback about Category 2 specifically. No matter what that feedback includes and whether you agree or disagree with the feedback that was submitted, it's not going to impact this next funding year. All right, so the 2018 cycle, that's the cycle we have the eligible services list now. We've got Form 470s being posted. That is moving forward. So if there are changes in the future, uh, that will impact funding year 2019 or later. Uh, I don't expect that there will be big changes to the E-rate program in the 2019 uh, funding year. But I don't know that for certain. certain. You know, and I always, uh, we have something here at Funds for Learning we call the pocketbook test. And we do that with our clients. You know, when we're, when we're trying to fill out forms or get some paperwork submitted, uh, you know, we always use the pocketbook, pocketbook test. Hey, if this, was, if this money was going into my pocket, you know, would I, would I take the time to get this form out today, make sure this was, you know, all the I's are dotted and T's were crossed. And if I pocketbook test this whole situation, I would say it's important to get the Category 2 application submitted this year. Uh, just because you don't know what 2019 will hold, and certainly you don't know what 2020 or 2021 would, um, has in store for you. Uh, now, if you, if you have a site that doesn't need anything, then my goodness, that's fantastic. And you shouldn't submit an E-rate application for it. You know, you don't want to just go out there to get, <coughs> excuse me, get something you don't necessarily need yet. But that is very rare. <laughs> In most cases, uh, when, we're, when we are looking through September 30th of 2019, that planning horizon, almost any facility uh, that, unless it was just wrapping up work today, will have some needs within you know that, that two year time frame. So I would really encourage you to think through, to inventory your sites, to go through site by site by site. What are our equipment needs here? And do we still have you know a category two budget? If you're not uh if you don't know what money may be left for your category two budget, uh feel free to uh contact us. You can email uh, help at fundsforlearning.com there and we have a uh, uh an estimator <laughs> 
of, of all those site budgets, we can. I'd be happy to provide you that information. But uh, take an inventory of all of your sites, then look at your Category 2 budgets for those facilities, and I would strongly encourage you for this 2018 cycle, to the extent that you have need, to really look at submitting that Category 2 application. The money is there. Uh, the, uh, the FCC has said they want to support this. Uh, they've, they've made the process. Uh, available to you, and it's really uh, up to you uh, to, and me and everyone else in this crazy village to get those applications in. And I would just really encourage you to do that because, again, you don't know what it may look like in the future, but we do know for this 2018 funding year that those dollars are there and that there is a significant uh, amount of money uh, still available uh, to schools and libraries. All right. Uh, with that, I'm going to uh, turn the mic over to Dan, and uh, Dan, uh, it's all yours. All right, thank you, John, and thank you for that incredible overview of the ERI program and just uh, the policy updates and what's happening, uh, not just locally within USAC uh, at the ERI level, but also federally, right, and what kind of policies are, are taking place to continue to help shape and improve uh, the program. But as we think about why we want to go after this funding, it's really coming back to the reason of uh, why, what is, what is bringing about the need for this new technology and particularly within the education environment. So it's, it's really because learning is transforming. So we had uh, here in the U.S. Uh, just a couple of hundred years ago, uh, all the learning that took place took place in the home. Right, it was uh, either one uh, parent uh, teaching the children, and if you were fortunate enough, you had a tutor who would come in. Uh, and then we continued to grow as a society. We continued to grow as a community. And then we would see uh, farmhouses turn into uh, school buildings, where you bring in all the children of all ages uh, with a single teacher, a textbook paper and pencil, uh, really instructing uh, the students as best they can in a large format. Then as we continue to grow as a society and change over into the industrial age where we had large cities, we saw that classroom shift as well into that kind of a uh, industrial type of environment. The children separated by grade levels uh, and the teaching specific to that grading. In fact, even the desks were lined up very much like an assembly line where uh, you'd have the instructor at the front of the room, uh, each pupil uh, lined up, and it was all about working independently of each other uh, and, and having that direct feedback or direct uh, direction from the, uh, from the teacher, all with a paper textbook, uh, paper and pencil, right? Teacher textbook, paper and pencil. Uh, then we saw technology come in. And we saw technology come into the classroom uh, in, in ways that would help to improve education. It's all about how do we educate more students uh, in, in a, in a uh, more efficient way. So that first piece of education technology, technology introduced to the classroom was the blackboard. It was introduced about 1890. And then about every 30 years, we see another type of technology uh, coming into the classroom that's going to transform the way, way we educate our children, whether it's in the 1920s with the radio uh, to the 1950s with the introduction of the television, even to the 1980s with the introduction of the PC. We saw each of these technologies coming into the classroom with the same promise that we were going to transform the way we educate our children. Uh, and after a short uh, peak of interest, we would kind of go back to the same way of teaching uh, with the te teacher, textbook, paper, and pencil. Uh, that brings us to about today, though. Now we see the introduction of what we call mobile learning. And in fact, there is a, uh, many different surveys over uh, across uh, a number of years through some other advocacy organizations. Uh, and they release it, COSIN being uh, one that just released one in, in 2017, the Coalition of School Networking, where they found that out of all of the uh, leaders in the IT industry within education, their priorities, mobile learning was in the top three for the first time this year. And so really, as we think about mobile learning, this is the every student having a mobile device. Even as John talked about the quotes uh, from the customers earlier, where they say, we rely on our internet connectivity because every student is now using a mobile device uh, for their learning. 
So as we look at that kind of technology, what's, what's changed? Why will this technology really be um, a true transformation in the way that we're educating our children? Uh, well, we know that uh, curriculum, we have curriculum, whether it's uh, digital, online, or blended curriculum, we have that available uh, that is uh, state approved, also uh, federally approved, and a major push to continue to bring more digital and online curriculum. Uh, we also have the adoption of the technology. And the students, that's an easy one. Uh, children are always uh, quick to adopt the latest technology. And typically, it's been the teachers that have been a little bit uh, the slower uh, adapters. But in, even now, uh, teachers are used to the technology of mobile devices. And so they were seeing the adoption of that technology by both the students and the teachers. And just as important as this, mean, this uh, webinar is today, we have the funding. We have funding at the federal, state, and local levels, uh, as well as the national levels, right, with E-rate program. Uh, but most importantly, we have the results. And time after time, we see student uh, student improvement. We see student performance increasing. We see student engagement increasing. So with all of that uh, put into play, we really do believe that the uh, education uh, technology will transform uh, the way we educate our kids, and we're seeing that today. So what does that look like? It looks like a classroom uh, that will support the different initiatives, whether it's a one-to-one -one initiative utilizing uh, BYOD or BYOT uh, type of initiative, or whether it's a district-issued device. Uh, there are initiatives all across the country about putting one device uh, for every student in the classroom. Uh, we see learning taking shape where it's more project-based learning. This really drives that student collaboration. And students are collaborating not only with each other in the same classroom, but also within uh, different classrooms, different schools, even different countries. It's all being enabled by this mobile-first learning style. Uh, it's a classroom that has uh, safe and secure access to cloud-based applications like My Microsoft Office 365e or Google Apps for Education. Uh, it's, an, it's a network that provides, or a classroom that provides guest access in a safe and secure manner and uh, gives you uh, support for online assessments. And so particularly here in the United States, we have, we have initiatives coming in uh, from the federal level. Uh, which really drive the need for online assessments and uh, through, through common core initiatives, uh, even if you're in a state that doesn't particularly, uh, that doesn't participate in, uh, in that type of learning, we do see every state of the union moving towards online assessments. So when we think about what mobile first learning requires, well, it requires a reliable, stable, network. And that's not just on the wireless side. It's also on the wired side because every wireless device is going to come back to a wire at some point. Uh, but questions to ask uh, yourselves as you, as you think about laying out this technology and spending the C-rate funds uh, to support this kind of network, you know, things to think about is can the teachers rely on a Wi-Fi uh, for 50 to 75 student devices at once? And you might go, well, hold on, our classroom average is about 24 students per classroom, which is true. But what we find is uh, in today's high school environments that the average student is bringing in an, uh, about 2.4 devices per student. So it's not just a mobile device like a telephone or a smartphone, excuse me, smartphone, uh, but also a laptop or a tablet, uh, as well as wearables like a Fitbit or an Apple Watch or all these devices craving and trying to attach to that network. So uh, can that Wi-Fi, uh, can the teacher rely on the Wi-Fi to support that many devices at one time? And with all of those different devices, can critical apps be prioritized to ensure student success? Uh, or is it going to get slowed down? Uh, do you have online testing happening in one room and that access is being slowed down by another classroom that might be doing a virtual field trip? So that, that network needs to be smart and capable enough to be able to prioritize those mission-critical education apps. And of course, as we talked about, is that Wi-Fi reliable for online testing? Uh, a couple of years ago, we saw uh, networks across the country being uh, challenged when uh, we're trying to do the online testing and we lose connectivity. Uh, we're seeing some improvements with that, but as John had said earlier, uh, we're a nation where we still don't have enough broadband access. So it's all about making sure that that local network is smart enough and reliable enough uh, to prioritize those apps, prioritize those connections, and keep them secure. So with all that, why, 
would you want to uh, why would you want to take a look at Aruba and what we have to offer? Well, uh, we're a company, Aruba. We're a Hewlett Enterprise, uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise company. We were founded in 2002. Uh, we went public in 2007, and if you didn't know, we were acquired by HP in 2015, uh, and we continue to grow. Uh, and when we started in that early 2000s, it was really in that era of uh, mobile technology, telephones getting smarter, smartphones getting smarter, introduction of uh, tablet computing and things like that. And we really built that concept of the intelligent edge. So everything being supported at that edge, that first connection, the access point, or that first wired port. Uh, we have a saying here where everything we do is customer first, customer last. And so each and everything we do, we do in mind with uh, the customer at the start of the project is all the way to the customer at the, at the end of the project. Everything is customer focused. Uh, we are continuing to innovate, uh, whether it be with uh, the Wi-Fi connections. Uh, and as John had stated, we are very active in policy engagement within the E-rate program, but we're also very active in policy engagement even when it comes to spectrum and adding spectrum with the FCC. Uh, and we continue to innovate to what is available. With that, uh, you can see throughout the years uh, where we've been, as, and when I say we, not as a company, but as, a, as <laughs> in the U.S. when it came to technology, the rapid growth of mobility happening and what we see coming in the not too distant future, we're talking 2020, just a few short years from now, over 20 billion devices uh, being connected to that infrastructure through the Internet of Things. Now, at a school district, you might say, well, I, I, what does IoT mean to a school district? It means everything. So it means not only your uh, typical student devices and things like that, uh, smart boards that are connecting to, uh, to the network, as well as smart projectors connecting to the network, uh, access control, door monitors, video surveillance, even things like irrigation control, all of these things coming onto that network. Uh, so you need a way to be able to safely and securely bring them onto the network, identify, make sure you have them with the right access. Uh, but I am getting ahead of myself. So I will say if, if that hasn't sold you yet, uh, we do believe in uh, you know, letting you know about some of the achievements that we've uh, been uh, recognized for. Uh, so there's an analyst called Gartner. They just recognized us. The report just came out a few days ago uh, as a leader when it comes to what they call their magic quadrant for wired and wireless uh, access infrastructure. So we're very excited about that. Uh, one thing that does make a really unique is we have an Airheads community. This is a community of you, our, our users, our customers, as well as our engineers. We currently have over 60,000 members of that community. It is free to join. Uh, I'll have some links later if you're interested in joining there, but it's an incredible resource to be able to uh, connect with your other colleagues uh, and, and discuss everything from uh, problems that you may have with a recent upgrade through devices, whether or even things like security problems, uh, such as the uh, uh, WPA2. And uh, you know, when you think about all of these concerns that happen, uh, uh, you know, really across the world, it's a great community to keep your finger on the pulse of that. Uh, so with that, we really think about what does mobile first primary education mean to us? Uh, it's all about mobile learning in four areas. Wi-Fi, switching, security, and mobile engagement. So we have a couple of quotes here uh, from our customers. I'll just take a quick second to read these. You know, when it comes to Wi-Fi, uh, we had uh, school district uh, Escambia County say, you know, the primary benefit of having the Ruben Networks is that it just works. Uh, over in Texas, when it came to security, Cypress Fairbanks uh, said the benefits of Aruba's ClearPass technology are extremely attractive and vital to our device initiative success. Uh, over uh, in Pulaski County, we, they, they were able to do a network infrastructure upgrade utilizing E-Rate, and they, they said that by replacing their existing switching with Aruba, they saved over 800000 in support and maintenance. And of course, we have an incredible customer in Bryanston who is uh, utilizing mobile engagement. This is location-based services. Uh, and their quote, direct quote is, pupils activate the resources when they move close to a beacon. What does that mean? There's beacons across their campus, and as they approach these beacons, they're able to engage with that resource and really drive an experiential type of learning. So some exciting things happening in education. Uh, one thing 
uh, that we see. Oh, uh, as far as our total portfolio when it comes to E-rate, uh, E-rate, there is an eligible services list that uh, it will only pay those discounts on services that are deemed eligible. As John said, the 2018 uh, eligible services was just released. Uh, that is up on the USAC website. It's also up on uh, Funds for Learning website as well as on Aruba's website. Uh, but really, what does that cover when we think about E-rate and eligible services from the Aruba portfolio? It's our infrastructure for wired and wireless, so uh, access points, controllers, uh, as well as switching and uh, switching not only at the edge, but also in, in your IDFs as well as your MDFs, and uh, core switching, so some of those network operation centers. So with that, I will do a quick touch on moving to the cloud. We see schools, 67% of school districts across the nation uh, are utilizing, uh, delivering part or all of their IT services through the cloud. So we do have a great cloud offering that is eligible under, uh, under E-rate. But uh, really, why would you want to consider moving to a cloud managed network? It's simple, it's intelligent, it's reliable, and it's flexible. One thing that we offer is the flexibility to begin with a cloud managed uh, infrastructure, switching uh, and wired, and deciding if you wanted to use a virtual controller rather than a cloud managed, uh, you can move along to our instant, and you don't have to replace any hardware you keep that hardware that you paid for. If you decide you want to do on-premise management, you can go ahead and do on-premise management with buying a controller and manage your network that way. You use the same infrastructure. You do not waste anything. So if you, even if you decide to let the cloud subscription end and not renew, that infrastructure that you put in is still yours, it's still fully capable, and you can management it, manage it either through the virtual controller uh, at no cost, or you can buy an on-premise controller to do it that way. Uh, with that, I wanted to uh, jump through, because I know we're a little short on time, just to tell you we have incredible customers, over 3,600 customers in the U.S. currently deploying Aruba solutions, including the largest U.S. school systems, uh, leveraging Aruba Wireless LAN solutions. Uh, a few of the customers, uh, when we think about it, we have uh, customers ranging across the country. It's also worldwide, but here's a few of the, uh, maybe more of the um, bigger customers, but also uh, some of the great rural customers, like in Fulton County in Broward County. Uh, all that to say, we do have a great uh, promotion that we have for education customers. It is our Aruba Central, which is our cloud managed uh, subscription. Uh, it's a five-year uh, subscription at an incredible price. More information will be here at this links here. Uh, and I would just encourage you as you um, want to take some next steps, definitely join the Airheads uh, community. It is free to join. Just go to community.aruba.works.com. Uh, you can try out our Aruba Central for free. There's uh, no cost. You sign up. You get a 90-day free trial to evaluate it, and you can also become an expert uh, for free as well. We have product trainings up online uh, there for you to review. So uh, with that, I want to go ahead and bring it back over to uh, uh, for questions because uh, there's a couple of questions I want to make sure we give John the opportunity to answer. Uh, John, one question that I saw uh, coming up, is uh, what percentage of private schools are currently participating in E-rate? Um, it's, uh, uh, I, I would say it's uh, pretty limited. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, a couple things. Sometimes it's just perception. Uh, you know, the E-rate dollars, although it is a federally administered program, those dollars themselves are not federal dollars. If you look on your phone bill, there's a universal service charge. All of us pay fees into this program, and therefore both public and private schools can participate. Uh, I know sometimes for private religious schools, for example, they're concerned that there may, may be some strings attached or something because these are federal dollars, but in this case, there are no such strings like that. Uh, so, you know, uh, uh, we work with uh, a lot of Catholic schools, for example, that, you know, do apply. But I would say nationwide, uh, it's an underserved uh, portion. Uh, also, charter schools. Uh, I'd say charter schools are a little better about uh, trying, uh, but oftentimes uh, they don't fully respect uh, the rigor <laughs> involved in the process. You know, just the fact that you know, just because you're poor and, and needy as a school uh, doesn't mean you you get to sort of 
uh, go straight to go and collect $200. You know, they still have to do those evaluation periods and sign the contracts. So, uh, you know, the thing I always encourage schools to, to do, especially those that haven't applied, is, you know, to understand the rules, follow them, take advantage of the program. It's there. It's a significant amount of money. Even if it's just a 50% discount, it's a 50% discount. <laughs> Uh, but make sure that you are, you really have to have someone that's managing the, the deadlines, making sure all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. Excellent. And, and thank you for that, John. And we do have several more questions coming in. I do want to acknowledge uh, Juan Rodriguez, who's been uh, key in answering those questions behind the scenes. So do keep those questions coming. And even after we close this webinar, uh, we will be getting back to you. To, uh, to answer those questions. So uh, please do keep those questions coming. With that, Andrew, I want to go ahead and turn it back over to you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dan. And thank you, John, for uh, truly an excellent presentation on the E-Rate uh, uh, program. Um, we are uh, almost out of time. But as Dan indicated, if you did ask a question today that we didn't get to, uh, someone from the Aruba team will follow up to, to get you an answer. Um, so as we wrap up, though, I, I want to thank again John Harrington and Dan Rivera for an excellent uh, presentation. I also want to thank Aruba for its support today. And one final reminder, uh, we will be sending out an email to all attendees when the recording of the webinar is ready. So thank you all, and this concludes today's webinar. Goodbye.